Okay. Good morning. I'm Sue Ellen Bethman. I'm the manager here at the Isolator Breeding Solutions Building. Uh, like I said before, I've been at Taconic about 12 years. Uh, started in the monoclonal antibody group, um, helped develop the QC uh, lab and the purification of the monoclonal antibody uh, group, and then moved over to contract research. So in helping to set up the purification lab, we had to start SOPs from scratch. Um, so I've had some good experience writing SOPs, revising SOPs, and that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Um, so SOPs really are, are important to detail the regular recurring work processes. You need them. They're important to minimize variability, uh, to promote quality throughout your organization. Uh, they're vital to ensure that your processes are completed the same way over time and across different staff. At some facilities, you might have different staff coming in on weekends or holidays versus the regular work week. You might have certain people dealing with the animals versus dealing with the equipment or the autoclave or the washroom. You want to make sure that everybody that's touching the processes are doing them in the same way. SOPs can be a great training tool for both new staff who's coming in and starting out as a reference for them to go back and also for your more seasoned staff over time, especially procedures that they might not do every day to go back and be able to look up those little details to ensure the success of your project. Um, and it also provides insurance that some variables in your research are, are minimized so that the type of caging, the type of food, the bedding, the light cycles, all those things can be dictated in an SOP to help minimize those variables. So you really want them to be clear and concise, complete, consistent, controlled, and current. So under clear and concise, you want your SOPs to be written in a, in a plain language. Somebody coming in with only maybe a basic understanding and a minimal amount of training should be able to understand what's going on, what's being asked of them, and be able to reproduce it with a minimal amount of questions or supervision. Any highly technical vocabulary, you should try to avoid. Or if you need to uh, use some highly technical vocabulary, maybe have a, a definition section for someone to go and, and reference and be able to look, look up what those terms mean. You want your step-by-step -step instructions to be thorough but concise. Avoid long sentences, avoid paragraphs. A bulleted list is great. And you can also use a section like that in an SOP to maybe develop a checklist that somebody could take with them when they go in to perform a certain procedure. They can check off or document the steps as they go. This is an example from one of our uh, SOPs about reprocessing an isolator, just to show some of the, the wording. So it's telling you to inspect the entire outside of the isolator, including the connection port and adapter for damage. It's pretty plain, pretty basic. Someone with only a minimal understanding of the isolator uh, would, would know what to do. And then at the bottom, it's telling you to inspect the welded seams in the isolator and the ports for signs of leakage, including air, light, moisture, or residue. And in the document itself, those would be listed out one on top of another uh, to make kind of a nice checklist for someone to come in and, and reference and then the action to report any damage to the production support supervisor, so telling them where to go next. Next under complete, you want to make sure that whatever process you're detailing in your SOP that you have all the steps from start to finish. Uh, to avoid your SOPs getting to be incredibly lengthy, it can be very helpful and useful to reference other SOPs. So for example, if you were writing a procedure that required the use of a pipette that needed to be calibrated, Rather than state out the whole calibration procedure within that document, you could say something like, ensure uh, your pipette is calibrated per document XYZ, and reference that as opposed to restating the whole calibration procedure. Some other things you might want to reference would be equipment manuals. That can be great for some troubleshooting, some technical help on certain pieces of equipment rather than copying over the equipment manual or sections of it. Any material safety data sheets that your employees would need reference to if they're working with chemicals or reagents, and also any personal protective requirements that they need to be aware of to successfully perform the procedure. And then I have an example in our, in our SOPs. We always have a reference section. Uh, in this particular SOP under safety and handling, we're referring the person to the personal protective equipment requirements and also to the SOP that talks about preparing our approved sterilants or disinfectants rather than go through the whole procedure again of how to make that sterilant. And then a little further on in that document under the reagents and preparation again we're referring them to the document that talks about making our sterilant as opposed to restating how to make it. Very very important to have consistency in your SOPs. 
as Frank said, it's all in the details. So the format, the font, the tone of the document, you want it to be the same across all your SOPs. Everything from the margins, the spacing, uh, the numbering system, you want really to make sure it's the same uh, across all your documents. The layout and the flow of the documents should be similar. Some things you want to make sure you are including would be the title, if you have quality control uh, or quality assurance requirements, maybe a listing of the contents. Uh, reference section is very helpful. And then within the procedure section, any definitions that you need, any work instructions, any safety, uh, all laid out. Um, and the level of detail across all your procedures and all your SOPs should be similar. So the example I found here is the format of our SOPs. Every document we have follows the same layout. Section one is always our quality assurance uh, requirements. Section two is always our description and references. So this document, we have just two sentences that really captures the essence of this procedure, which again is reprocessing of our isolators. And it tells you right in the document, it's going to involve removing the animals and supplies, cleaning and sterilization of the dirty isolator. Really captures succinctly what that document is talking about. And then our next section is always references. And in this section, we would list out every other SOP that might be referenced in this document and any other documents, such as those equipment manuals, material safety data sheets, things like that, anything that someone might need to go to reference to perform this procedure. Important to have control over your documents. It's a good idea to have a person or maybe a small group of people as the owners of particular documents. It could be the subject matter expert could be the manager of the facility that uses that document most commonly. You want to have an owner so that any revisions are, are controlled and should be routed through that owner. Also important to make sure when you're dealing with revisions or approving new documents that all the relevant stakeholders have had a chance to provide input and look over the revision. That could be your vet sciences group, your IACUC group, uh, maybe a safety committee or biosafety committee that needs to oversee the document and make sure they've had a chance to have input into that procedure. When you do have revisions or new documents, you want to make sure that you're removing any old versions and make sure that only the most recent version is available to staff to use. Uh, one tip is maybe to use expiration date when the document is printed. It's an easy way to ensure if you see a hard copy that it is the most current. Very, very helpful to have some kind of electronic system to track your documents. Uh, they could contain things like the current version number, the history of the document, maybe a list of staff who's authorized to approve or make revisions. And this could be something quite extensive. There are document control systems out there electronically that will do help manage this. It could be something as simple as an Excel spreadsheet that's manually updated. And you'd want to make sure that had the title, the version, the date, um, maybe the owner, maybe a few people someone could go to if they had questions on the document. And current, it's very important that your SOPs are re-looked at on a regular basis, maybe annually or, or every two years. You want to be going back to your approved documents and looking them over for things. Uh, maybe some of your practices have changed or drifted a little bit, or maybe there's a new industry best practice that we, you need to get captured in that document. You might have had some regulatory changes. Uh, the guide was recently revised. That might have had some impact on some of your documents. Maybe documentation requirements have changed in your facility, frequency of animal observations, anything like that. Also want to look over your equipment and your materials list to make sure that that is still accurate and up to date. Perhaps your organization has switched vendors on a type of glove or the type of bedding you're using. Um, in some of the equipment SOPs, you might have a particular brand reference that you need to go back and update. So important to go back, look over it, and make those updates. And I just have a few slides of lists. These are partial lists of the SOPs that we use at Taconic to work in isolators. This first is a partial list of the SOPs for the flexible film isolators, which we'll have one set up for this afternoon for the hands-on demonstration, just so you can see the, the breadth of the number of documents uh, that we have here. Uh, everything from taking samples for microbiological monitoring, how to close the port, how to enter supplies, hook up your supplies, all the way down to the material handling documents about preparing the feed and stocking the cylinders that will supply the isolator. And the next slide is again a partial list for the semi-rigid isolators and also the facility that the semi-rigid isolators are contained in. Uh, this includes everything from the schedule for the entire facility to be sanitized, 
how we distribute and release raw materials to the production areas, how we collect biopsy samples from our animals, all the way down to some vet sciences documentation about IDing and evaluating pain and distress in laboratory rodents. Now, this is about uh, 14 documents that would fit on this slide. Our, our total list for this building is closer to 80 for a fully trained animal care technician to have uh, to reference to ensure they're getting all those procedures done. And then finally, uh, just have a slide with a few references for maybe some more technical aspects of the SOPs. Uh, the first, germ-free animal and biomedical research. Uh, this I found on Google eBooks and at a site called alibris.com. Uh, this document uh, really gets into the anatomy of germ-free animals, dietary considerations, uh, things like that. Uh, the second book, uh, Isolation Technology, this I, is available on Amazon. And this is more of a how-to guide, how to get your clean room set up, how to maintain the sterility. Uh, talks a little bit about improving productivity and efficiency of the people working with your isolators. Looks like a great resource. And then the last is an ALAS publication called 50 Years of Laboratory Animal Science, which I also did find available on Amazon. That gives a lot of history and, and great reference material there as well.